Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Automatic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Viral Jain from Cincinnati, Ohio, United States. Dr. Jain is an associate professor of orthopedics at the University of Cincinnati and practices as pediatric spine and orthopedic surgeon at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Dr. Jain did his medical school and residency at Gujarat University in Ahmedabad, India, and subsequently did fellowships in pediatric orthopedics and orthopedic spine surgery in Cincinnati, United States. Dr. Jain joined as assistant professor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital in 2008, and he's a board certified orthopedic surgeon. His main interests are spinal deformities, minimally invasive spine surgeries, spine growth modulation, pediatric cervical spine, neurofibromatosis, and pediatric limb deformities. Dr. Jane has conducted several instructional course lectures at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons mm -hmm. meeting, has written several book chapters, and has been invited as faculty for a number of international meetings, including the Scoliosis Research Society, the POSNA, the AAOS, and the POSICON. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Viral Jain from Cincinnati, Ohio. Over to you, Viral. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lopalan, for a nice introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, surgical principles um, and techniques of uh, correction for idiopathic scoliosis. For most part, we will be focusing on uh, primary thoracic curves, but the techniques can be applied to this uh, uh, anywhere on the spine. Um, keeping in mind that we are talking about idiopathic scoliosis only today. Um, any surgical technique begins with planning. So we need to know Lanky classification, how do we select fusion levels and how do we strategize instrumentation? And then we'll go through the steps of the surgery. So Lanky classification, a bit complex, but once you um, understand the principles, um, it's not that um, uh, difficult to understand. Uh, so type one and two um, are thoracic only, three and four are uh, uh, thoracic and lumbar, five and six are primarily lumbar. So let's focus on Lanky 1A. It's a single thoracic curve as a lumbar modifier, which is, um, um, which is this line, which is called a central sacral line. Um, is depicted here uh, in yellow. And um, when the line falls between the pedicles of the apex of the lumbar curve, which is depicted by this green arrow, uh, it's the lanky number one, um, modifier A. When the central sacral line, the blue line falls within the apex of the pedicles, uh, apex of the lumbar uh, vertebral pedicle, it is lanky 1D. And then lanky 1C is where the central sacral line falls out of the pedicle um, or the actual vertebral body at the apex of the lumbar curve. Important to remember that these, this is related to the apex of the lumbar curve. So when we talk about lanky 1C, and we always have to uh, differentiate it from lanky 3 and lanky 5. So non-structural here is any curvature that bends below 25 degrees. And there is some controversy about that curve, um, that uh, definition as well. But for, for bar and large, it has uh, uh, stood the test of time. So as you can see here, a lanky 1 lumbar is non-structural, lanky 3 it is structural. In lanky five, the thoracic is not structural. So this is a 60 degree thoracic curve, 52 degree lumbar curve. Well, the question is, is this a double major curve? Is this a false double major curve? Which is the terminology that was used in King's classification um, many years ago. So in lanky classification, this would be well, uh, one C. So let's see what happens when you do a bending film well, when you do a bending film, the thoracic curve by definition is still structural, uh, but the lumbar curve bends down to 15 degrees. So it is not structural. So this, is, this was a lanky 1C curve. And then the thoracic curve to lumbar curve ratio is 1.15. And we'll discuss about that ratio a little later. Uh, look at this example, 68 degree thoracic, 66 degree lumbar. To me, it looks like it's a double major curve 
um, because you know, based on the, the anatomy, it looks like both the curves are major. Uh, whether the question is whether it is a primary lumbar curve versus a lanky 1C where primary thoracic curve. Bending film obviously is, is structural thoracic. And when the patient bends to the other side, the lumbar curve goes below uh, 25 degrees. So that is a non-structural curve. Lanky 1C, thoracic and lumbar ratio is almost the same. Um, 42 degree thoracic, 55 degree lumbar curve. So look at the apical translation of the lumbar curve uh, and the thoracic curve. It seems like the, it is a primarily uh, lumbar curve, which means lanky 5C. The question is, is it double major? And from the anatomy, it looks like it's unlikely to be a 1C curve. Bending film proves that thoracic curve is not structural. You go back and it makes sense. It doesn't look like it's structural. And then reverse bend, the thoracic, the lumbar curve bends down even further and it corrects even further than the thoracic curve. So according to the definition, none of those curves are structured. But take a look, it is a, a substantial scoliosis and it has to some, be some structural component. So this is the uh, controversy regarding lanky classification and the classification of whether a 25 degree or below curvature would be considered non-structural or not. So based on the classical principle, I would classify this curvature as, as a lanky 5C. Um, so focusing on lanky one curves, um, there is a touch rule which indicates that whenever you draw a central sacral line and wherever it touches uh, the caudal most vertebral body of the thoracic curve, that's where you can stop in terms of your instrumentation. This principle applies only for lanky 1A and 1B curves. So again, when you draw a central sacral line, you can select as your distal instrumentation level the vertebra that this line touches. So you can see in this particular example, the central sacral line does uh, touch uh, the last rib bearing vertebra, which is uh, T12. And we went down to T12. Uh, we could have gone down to T12, but we went down one level below because the central sacral line bisects the uh, L1 vertebra. And in that case, I, th I thought it was a uh, better construct not to stop at thoracic lumbar junction. Another example, uh, in this particular case, uh, the last rib bearing vertebra uh, is considered T12. And you can see central sacral line does touch the T12 vertebra and we could have stopped there. So, Whenever you do a thoracic only fusion, the question is, is this really a selective thoracic fusion? Well, by definition, selective thoracic fusion is done when, the, when there are two substantial curvatures and you only uh, fuse the thoracic curve. So in, by, by definition, a lanky one, uh, one curvatures, and, and when you don't fuse the lumbar spine, um, it is not a selective thoracic fusion. So goal of the spinal fusion, whether it's selective or non-selective is to provide better balance, but at the same time, save some levels for motion segments. And so we have to balance between um, the mobility that we are going to provide by not fusing the lumbar spine but at the same time, you have to balance it with a proper cor uh, correction of the curvature so that both thoracic and lumbar curves are in balance and there is no coronal imbalance. So Lanky, um, you know, almost 20 years ago, published this paper and uh, recommended that Lanky 1C curves could be treated by selective thoracic fusion. So initially, we followed um, 
look at the previous example that we saw, it's 68 degree thoracic, 66 degree lumbar. It bent down to 16 degrees, the lumbar curve. So this was a lanky 1C curve by, di by diagnosis or definition. Uh, we did selective only thoracic fusion in this patient. And uh, you can see the result immediately post-op patient went down. Um, the, the lumbar curve did not correct and had a significant coronal imbalance, which persisted. Over a period of time, it did get better, um, but it, you can still see a residual lumbar curve. So what went wrong in this patient? How to avoid trouble? So later on, um, there were several papers that were published by uh, Lanky's group and others, uh, which further narrowed the indication of doing a selective thoracic fusion in Lanky 1C curve. And the, the criteria were the ratio between the main thoracic and the thoracolumbar lumbar curve uh, based on Cobb angle, apical vertebral translation, rotation, and flexibility. And that magic numbers appears to be one to one to one, uh, 1 1.2. Um, and there is something called as a deformity flexibility quotient as well uh, for 1C and to a certain extent 1B curves. The other things that we do know uh, over a period of time is that patients with open triridate cartilages have a greater risk of um, proximal as well as uh, distal add-on. And they have less predictable lumbar curve correction and they can actually have more rotation as they mature. So looking at this example, uh, this obviously is a lanky 1C curve, um, but we did a selective thoracic fusion. And as you can see in this example, the thoracic curve uh, is substantially larger than the lumbar curve and the ratio is more than 1.2. Um, at the same time, if you look at the rotation, thoracic curve is far more rotated than the lumbar spine. Um, and so this would be a very, uh, you know, an ideal candidate for a selective thoracic fusion. And we had a good result. So what are the long-term outcomes of selective thoracic fusion? So selective thoracic fusion uh, on a 20 year follow-up, uh, the patients who underwent those surgeries had no significant progression of the lumbar curve and no worsening of uh, L4 obliquity. Um, the SRS scores were higher uh, in, uh, um, in patients who had long fusions indicating that it may be better to have a balanced spine and uh, no coronal imbalance, in other words, better correction of the lumbar curve, either by instrumentation or non-instrumentation, uh, as opposed to saving the fusion levels. However, this topic do remain, does remain controversial because we do not have long-term data on the unfused lumbar spine. Um, conclus I should say conclusive long-term data on unfused lumbar segments, whether fusion to L4 versus L3 versus L2 has any clinical relevance 25 years later. So that was more theory, planning, let's go through the surgical technique. Steps are exposure, you do posterior release instrumentation, correction, wound grafting fusion and closure. Midline skin incision, uh, when, when you make the incision, I usually try to find the tips of the spinous processes and um, make my um, incision go down with electrocautery over the spinous processes. So we obviously want to stay in the midline. Um, I do like to split the apophysis using the electrocautery. Um, and that is a one way of ensuring that we always stay in the midline. And the apophysis are present in patients who are uh, relatively young. And then you do the exposure of the spine from one transverse process to the other transverse process. So the entire spine is exposed. So this is my uh, way of uh, exposing the spine um, and finding the spinous processes. I use a, uh, a, um, a Kelly clamp uh, to make the spinous processes prominent and then split them with a cartridge. 
So avoid exposing facet joints at the very top level and the bottom level to avoid junctional issues um, and take the, maintain the integrity of the midline structures at those two levels. It prevents junctional kyphosis both proximally and distally. So as you can see in this example, the very proximal level, um, uh, the midline ligaments are intact. Uh, let me pull up my, um, um, I think you can see. Um, so this is the area where you would see in the intact midline ligaments. And then uh, my mentor used to say the word shine the spine, essentially cleaning the spine and you know, cleaning it off of any soft tissues that will help later on with fusion. You do posterior release, we essentially do a, a, a inferior facetectomy means using either the um, uh, osteotome or I sometimes use the Kapner's gouge uh, to perform uh, posterior release. And then you select the anchors. And my uh, weapon of choice is pedicle screw construct. Now, there have been um, several multiple, I should say, uh, papers regarding the disadvantages of pedicle screw construct, but that they are costly, they cause thoracic flatback, they obviously increase the risk of neurological injury. And if you are using C arm um, or fluoroscopy, then it increases the risk of radiation. Now, the cost can be variable depending on your um, which market you're in and how you negotiate with the vendor. Um, radiation can be pretty much avoided when you uh, do a free hand uh, vertical screw insertion technique. Uh, however, it does have advantages, provides uh, three column fixation, better correction of scoliosis for coronal as well as derotation. And it has been uh, you know, validated in multiple studies. Uh, it is possible to save distal fusion level as compared to when you use a hook type construct. It uh, can prevent uh, crankshaft, which again has been proven by uh, several papers, and an extremely low rate of implant failure and repeat surgery as compared to uh, the previously used um, hook and wire construct. It does have uh, you know, concerns regarding neurological injury, which is medial to the pedicle, and it can also cause vascular injuries if you breach laterally and, and too far anteriorly. So these are scary images, as you can see, obviously, uh, and that has led to uh, some caution regarding the pedicle screw insertion techniques. Now, we use um, freehand technique. There are several ways to put uh, pedicle screws and the most common being the freehand technique that was popularized by uh, Lenke and his group. But there are other ways you can use, uh, other techniques that you can use. So in the freehand technique, the primary um, landmark is, um, is, is depicted in uh, this picture uh, on the left side A, you have to select the outer half of the superior articular process and align that with the superior border of the transverse process. And those meeting point is where the pedicle usually is. Um, I should say uh, it's a little bit lateral and superior there. Obviously you do not want to start in the medial half of the superior percent. And then there are several charts that are available uh, depending on the levels. However, if you follow the rule, um, uh, this is this rule is true for all, almost all the levels in the thoracic spine. Um, use a lanky gear shift. Uh, I would like to call this gear shift as a lanky gear shift. Yes, it was designed by him. Uh, it's a curved gear shift. You start inserting the pedicle. Um, finding the pedicle screw by inserting it um, turned outwards or laterally uh, in order to avoid the, the canal. And it usually at 20 millimeters uh, is when you clear the canal and then you can take it out and turn it over to medial side and uh, you can go in further to achieve more length and fixation in the vertebral body as well. 
Now, I usually use a ballpoint probe to measure the depth of the pedicle or the length of the pedicle, uh, which at the same time gives you an advantage of uh, palpating all the uh, five walls of the pedicle. And then you do tapping. Tapping does cause expansion of the pedicle itself and allows you to put a uh, pedicle screw, which is uh, a thicker, and it gives you better fixation. And you have to put the screws very slowly so as to avoid fracture of the pedicle. Um, this is a video showing what we do. Uh, use the probe to palpate the walls, tap it, Again, use the probe to make sure that you tapped in the correct trajectory and then insert the pedicle screw. And then you confirm the screw placement. Uh, once you are done with uh, the free uh, inserting the screws through th fluoroscopy, when you are doing fluoroscopy, you have to make sure that you account for the rotation uh, of the spine. So I typically, typically what you would want to do is to rotate the, the, the arm of the fluoroscope um, or the C-arm in order to make sure that the spinous processes are in the midline, or I should say in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the vertebral body. This is how you compensate for the rotation of the, of the curvature. And then you analyze the trajectory of the screws, make sure that screws are all, almost all the, uh, screws should be pointing medially, and uh, none of the screws should be crossing the midline. Uh, crossing the midline usually indicates a medial breach. And then you test with uh, the EMG potentials. Uh, thoracic spine has a, uh, in, our, in our practice has a threshold of uh, eight to 10 uh, millivolts. And if it is less than that, and it, that is, uh, you should take the screw out, check for the uh, intactness of the medial and the inferior walls. And then the curve correction. Traditional correction technique when you use with pedicle screw is based on uh, rod rotation, which has been uh, described by Cottrell many, many uh, decades ago. However, in my practice, in my uh, experience, uh, that has caused um, rod flattening when you use it with the pedicle screws. It also sometimes causes worsening of the rib prominence. So in order to control for the convex rib prominence, you have to push down on the rib prominence using the um, sequential reducers or the sticks and that in itself can cause a thoracic flatback. So um, the other concept is metal density or implant density. Um, the low density screw constructs have been shown to have similar outcomes, which means that you do not need to put pedicle screws at each level. Um, that significantly reduces your cost uh, if you don't do that. So. Um, the questions that are unanswered are whether low implant density construct gives you better correction of kyphosis or better preservation of kyphosis, whether it, it is equivalent to uh, in terms of the actual correction as compared to the high implant density construct. And the construct itself uh, is questionable whether what kind of construct you should use when you are using low implant density technique. So there is a variation of the low implant density construct, as you can see, uh, where you can do every alternate screws, where you can do screws on the concave side and leave the convex side alone, or you can do all concave side and every other convex side. There are multiple ways of doing it. And at the, on the right, rightmost image is the traditional uh, pedicle screw construct that, uh, that I used to do uh, you know, many years ago. So our instrumentation for this philosophy is based on several principles. The instrumentation needs to be multi-segmental in order to avoid failure. You should have a stable base or the distal construct, adequate, adequate proximal construct uh, in order to avoid the screw pull out proximally and potentially causing spinal cord injuries. You also need a pickle control, obviously, for the better correction of scoliosis, um, should be able to perform derotation, you should restore kyphosis, um, and also pay attention to shoulder balance. And uh, one of the concerns that I had was uh, um, all pedicle screw construct had increased implant density and these were very expensive. Um, so I um, 
innovated with the idea and came up with this construct, uh, which is multi-segmental, has a adequate proximal fixation, has stable, um, stable distal fixation, has adequate um, apical control derotation, it takes care of the PJK, and it is a low implant density construct. So technique, uh, I use um, the convex rod first. I do not use the rod rotation. I do uh, convex rod first dropped in. And so the correction happens with translation. Then you use uh, your uh, sticks or derotation tubes to perform single rod derotation. Um, then you put the second uh, rod on the concave side, which is contoured in ex uh, extreme amount of kyphosis. So that's why I call it as a differential rod con contouring technique um, that allows us to pull the spine towards the rod and it also controls the apex and also provides additional derotation. And then if necessary, you can perform double rod derotation. Um, so in my construct, I usually use four four points of proximal fixation plus a hook, which avoids screw pull out and also um, gives you a soft transition from pedicle screw to a hook to no construct and also reduces the risk of proximal junctional kyphosis. You have a, uh, four points of stable distal fixation, apical control with eight points of fixation. Um, rod is contoured differentially. As you can see, the top rod is the concave rod and it's longer because I have a hook on that side, but also it is uh, contoured more in kyphosis as compared to the lower rod, which is on the convex side, which is my primary correction rod. Um, so I insert the convex rod first. I capture the rod at the cranial, uh, first the cranial levels and then the caudal levels and leaving the apex alone, uh, bring the rod in proper sagittal plane, and then reduce the spine to the rod with sequential reducers. And they repeat the same technique for the other side with some differences. So this is my convex rod on a, on a scoliotic spine. I fix it uh, proximally. Uh, right now it is in the direction of the curvature. Then I turn it over and make it in the proper sagittal plane. Um, and then I use these sequential reducers. These, the rod is not fixed to the apical vertebra right now. Uh, it is just uh, hanging out in the air, but it's, it is within these sequential reducers. And then I use a rod holder uh, to push the spine over and try and bring the rod over to the distal two screws while controlling the apex loosely with uh, this um, um, sequential reducers. And then as you can see now, the rod is fixed in the uh, distal screws. And then I use the sequential reducers to derotate uh, doing a single rod derotation uh, while holding the rod on one side uh, at one point. And that's how you do most of your coronal correction has already happened at this stage, and now you're doing just derotation in another view of the same thing. Now, um, you can also use the sequential reducers on the concave side and link them together um, and also achieve additional derotation, still uh, single rod derotation. And so most of the curvature is already uh, corrected at this point in time. Uh, we have restored some of the kyphosis, even from the top, you, you can see that. Now I put the rod in a hyper-contoured fashion, uh, secure the rod at the proximal two and the distal two levels, uh, leaving the apex alone. And then slowly bringing uh, the uh, rod back um, rather the spine close uh, towards the rod and then you can also do double derotation double rod derotation at the end so as you can see from the side view you you have um, achieved some uh, restoration of kyphosis now of course this is the bone model so uh, it is dramatic uh, in a in a in a spine, obviously, would not be this dramatic right away. 
and then you do bone grafting, stick to the basic principles of hips and albi technique for decortication. <clears throat> I usually use a Kapner's gouge to uh, decorticate. Bar is usually only a second best to Kapner's gouge because you do lose bone, which is precious. Um, use the excised bone pieces from the facetectomies in a resection of the articular process, uh, uh, resection of the transverse processes. And if necessary, use ribs for uh, autologous bone graft. Um, and then final tightening of the uh, caps. And then you close the layers, uh, muscles with deep fascia. And I usually put drain on the subcutaneous plane. So just an example, 52 degree, uh, fairly straightforward idiopathic scoliosis, um, an excellent correction. Another uh, a little extreme example, excellent correction later on. And as you can see in this particular patient, the patient was hypokyphotic or to a certain extent lorotic, which we were able to control uh, with pedicle screw uh, and without creating any flat back. Uh, another example, um, you can also use the same technique uh, in the lumbar spine. So I did, uh, we did an evaluation of our technique um, and uh, was the purpose was to compare um, the uh, number of screws per level, clinical and radiographic outcomes with the implant density, you know, high density versus low density, restricted uh, the patient population to length like, type one and two only. And uh, almost 200 patients, uh, 122 patients uh, met our inclusion criteria. Um, and then we did the radiographic measurement uh, by an independent evaluator. Um, and then use the T, you know, T test uh, for a simple uh, uh, calculation. The low implant density had 57 patients, high implant density had 65 patients. Uh, we did a radiographic analysis based on the previously uh, published uh, criteria for curve flexibility, correction index for the thoracic and then we also looked for thoracic uh, global kyphosis, T2 to T12. And this is our um, uh, patient population. The uh, age uh, was pre pretty similar. The pre-op Cobb angles were pretty similar. The pre-op rib index, which was previously published, was pretty similar as well. And curve flexibility was also pretty similar. Um, obviously, uh, we had uh, less number of screws per level. Um, the operative time and the estimated blood loss were similar. Radiographic criteria, none of these were statistically significant, uh, except for the final T2, T2 to T12 kyphosis angle. But clinically, it's only three degree difference between the high density and the low density group but it does prove that uh, the low density uh, constructs in general, regardless of the, what technique you use for correction, uh, does uh, restore or uh, um, save the kyphosis better as compared to high density um, all pedicle screw constructs. And um, surprisingly, our loss of correction rate was lesser as compared to the high density group, which I could not uh, explain, but the fact that we may have used different constructs uh, and different instrumentation systems. Um, so our study did obviously show, uh, you know, advantages of low density construct, which has been previously studied and has been published as well. Our results were similar. So no detected difference between high and low implant density construct on the curve correction. So next step was to evaluate our instrumentation strategy. Um, um, our researcher did a, a lot of work on this and uh, it's been called as peri apical dropout screw uh, construct, uh, which is the uh, fancy name for doing a convex rod first, dropping the rod in rather than rotating the rod and using the differential contouring techniques. 
So this was a, a slightly different patient population, had uh, uh, 33 patients in, uh, uh, with the, um, the technique that I just mentioned, and uh, 28 patients with a traditional rod rotation technique. We looked at the radiographic and clinical outcomes, uh, regression tests and t-tests. We excluded patients uh, who underwent uh, ponti osteotomy, so severe curves were excluded. Uh, we did the radiographic analysis for apical vertebral rotation with a rib index correction uh, or double rib contour sign, which has been uh, previously published by Krivas. We decided about the rib index correction by preoperatively double rib contour sign, um, again, uh, using the Krivas technique. And then we looked at the individual vertebral rotation preoperatively using the Raymond D ruler and postoperatively, since you can't use the ruler in, this, in the same fashion uh, when the medical is instrumented, we use the Upasani method, which was uh, published about 10 years ago. So as you can see, there was uh, really no difference in the patient population. Uh, these, were, uh, these were our uh, more recent cases. So the technique, the surgical technique, the instrumentation, uh, types and the type of the metal that we used. Uh, these were all pretty similar. Um, so essentially I started with uh, the traditional technique and used the same instrumentation, same cons uh, with a different construct later on. So these were, uh, these were not uh, similar in terms of um, the timeline. So we looked at the radiographic outcomes and uh, obviously group A, uh, which is uh, our current technique uh, showed ex uh, excellent uh, correction uh, up to 10 degrees at an average improvement uh, uh, in, in terms of the percentages. Uh, and the correction index obviously would be uh, higher as well. The rib index correction, or in other words, the, the D rotation of the, uh, of the curvature was also better. Um, it did not reflect a whole lot in uh, in uh, the kyphosis restoration or preservation, uh, but there was a uh, there was a clinically noticeable uh, difference. So derotation, uh, obviously, you can see um, preoperative uh, Raymond D ruler in final follow-up Upasani grade were significantly better. Uh, blood loss, surgical time, uh, obviously, were sim similar but total implant cost and the pedicle screw cost uh, was significantly less. The SRS30 scores uh, were similar as well. So in coronal plane, uh, our technique does provide better coronal correction of the deformity uh, with or without flexibility taken into consideration. Restoration of kyphosis uh, is obviously a plus when you use a low implant density construct, regardless of the type of the technique you use. But since I uh, um, merged the two techniques of uh, low implant density construct with uh, a convex rod uh, correction technique, I cannot uh, in, um, um, comment on which plays the, the major role. But in general, it has been uh, it has been uh, published in the literature that uh, low implant density construct probably plays the better, bigger role. The actual plane correction is definitely better uh, with the technique that I uh, showed, um, and it is highly significant. So, uh, proposed construct gives you better correction, both coronal and the actual plane, and also it maintains your. Um, Sagittal plane contour. Obviously, because of the low density construct, our implant costs were 11% less. Um, and when we did a subsequent analysis, and it actually uh, it comes down to about 25% less uh, in terms of the pedicle screw cost uh, as, as we have refined our technique. Um, obviously, this technique has limitation. You cannot. I have. I have sometimes used it in the neuromuscular curves, but not sufficient number of patients that I can uh, recommend. Um, it is also sort of limited in very, very severe and rigid curves. 
Um, although recently in the last three years, I have used the, this technique for more rigid curves with extensive osteotomies and have uh, found excellent results. So in short, this is the construct. I think uh, if you do not want to follow the technique that I mentioned, you, I think uh, this construct itself makes sense and it probably is um, as good as any other construct with a low implant density uh, that has been previously described. Um, I would, uh, you know, um, uh, I would uh, uh, ask you to see if you can, uh, even if you are doing rod derotation uh, technique, uh, try to do it on the convex side first. I think it will, you'll be surprised how good uh, it can be, and uh, and then you you will uh, you will be able to correct the coronal achieve the coronal correction just by the convex side, and then you can use the concave side to achieve additional coronal correction, or you can also uh, achieve uh, better kyphosis restoration, even with uh, the traditional technique. Thank you. Thank you, Viral, for that uh, fantastic presentation. We've gone into real tips and tricks uh, that we need to, uh, someone has to follow when they do a scoliosis surgery. Uh, just a few questions for the benefit of our audience. You uh, can you explain more about junctional kyphosis and crankshaft phenomenon? Of course, you've mentioned about how to reduce junctional kyphosis by preserving the supraspinatus and the infraspinous ligaments at the top of the curve. Would you? How do? You, how does it present normally? Junctional kyphosis. So usually, uh, in our practice, the kids who are uh, lean and thin, which is what we will see patients in India as well. Um, they come, they present with a proximal uh, implant prominence. Um, and, um, you know, clinically, if, they, if we have not made them aware of this condition, then they would just say that, you know, uh, our implants hurt or, or they are prominent, but when you can clearly see it on the lateral view. Um, rarely in patients with scoliosis uh, that I have had to take... Uh, take them back for um, extension of instrumentation proximally, which is what is described uh, in terms of the treatment. Um, the patients who have kyphoscoliosis, and you will find those patients uh, time to time, they are at a higher risk of developing this because we are using a very rigid construct to achieve correction of scoliosis, uh, which obviously results in mismatch between the proximal construct, which has no uh, which is rigid and then uh, uninstrumented spine. Um, with the use of this uh, single hook on one side, and I use that hook on the left side because most of the curves are right side in order to control the proximal thoracic curve. So the hook serves two purposes. It controls the proximal thoracic curve. It's a downgoing transverse process hook. So you can compress on that hook in order to correct the curvature. And at the same time, the hook is, you know, gives you a, a little sloppy construct there and it reduces your, um, your risk of junctional kyphosis. In a patient who has both scoliosis and kyphosis, then I would use hooks on both sides in order to control the proximal segment a little bit better. Thank you. And what about crankshaft phenomenon? So I have seen crankshaft phenomenon uh, even with the all pedicle screw construct. And what happens is that the, the spine in the area where you have instrumented with pedicle screws does not, does not crankshaft, but the spine that you have left uh, below will still rotate. And that will eventually cause you know, loss of um, rotational correction uh, over a period of time. You know, obviously it is not as substantial as uh, as a, a all hook or hook and uh, wire construct. Thank you, Viral, for that. Uh, Viral, there's also a lot of emphasis on minimally invasive surgeries, for example, magnetic control rods and vertebral body tethering. Do you think over a period of time these are going to replace these traditional extensile surgical approaches? Um, I can certainly tell you that more and more patients want. Uh, um, you know, vertebral body tethering. Uh, once they have been made aware or have they, they have read about the advantages of uh, it being more physiologic as opposed to a spinal fusion. And obviously it has its own limitation as of right now. I, I don't think we understand the, um, the spine growth very well 
and that's that's always going to be the limitation of how we apply those techniques. Uh, but even in my practice, uh, there are more and more patients who have been asking for it. Um, I see um, a, a tremendous advantage uh, if we can reduce uh, the risk of uh, re reoperations with vertebral body tethering, because essentially, uh, once you counsel the patients that a straight spine is not necessary uh, in the perfect spine, but a little curved spine up to 30, 35 degrees uh, with maintained motion is actually better than a straight spine with no motion. I think they will understand uh, the outcomes uh, and they will, excuse me, the, uh, they will be happier with their outcomes. I think currently the, the issue is um, an unacceptably high rate of repeat surgeries. And that's why whenever I select these patients for tethering, you have to be very select selective. But hopefully with uh, advancement in the materials, especially the tether itself, uh, and this, these results would be, would be obviously, you know, we can use those techniques for a larger number of patients. And it is obviously minimally invasive. We do it with a thoracoscope and it has substantial advantages. I've also done uh, posterior fusion with minimally invasive techniques, um, or rather I should say mini open. And those patients, even in a mini open technique versus traditional fusion, I've seen considerable um, advantages in terms of their um, recovery rate um, with the similar radiographic outcomes. Thank you for that. Uh, Sintel is also in our Zoom room. Uh, Sintel, uh, you have questions to Viraj. Viraj, it's a very good presentation. I'll, I don't do spine, but I'll ask some questions for, for, for the viewers all over the world. So what's your pre-op uh, evaluation protocol like do you, do you just go with x-rays what kind of x-rays and do you get any cts um very rarely i do ct scans for idiopathic scoliosis um unless uh, they have uh, you know if if we can't visualize obviously the uh the proximal areas because sometimes uh when patients come with a higher degree curvature uh you the proximal thoracic spine is the is the area where you will encounter concavity in a stiff curve, um, but very rarely I do CT scans. Usually uh, we do minimum two assessments of those patients. So the first time we see patients, even though they are uh, indicated for surgical intervention, um, we do initial analysis of the range of motion, um, measure them uh, clinically, obviously with forward flexion and see how far down they will go, um, but objectively use the um, the ruler to see how far forwards um, their motion segment, um, their, um, excuse me, not forwards, but uh, how much motion they have aside, you know, side to side as well as front to back. Um, I still use uh, the inclinometer to check for the reprominence. Um, and then we'll call those patients back uh, for surgery. Um, we do a, 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 a formal pre-op evaluation uh, that visit is about an hour long, and there is a lot of education involved um, from uh, the surgeon, specifically talking about the surgery, but also our nursing staff gives them a lot of information about what to expect during and after surgery. Um, the, uh, except for uh, because of the pandemic, um, we have not been able to do some of this, but we usually have a couple of uh, former patients who have gone through this surgery and have uh, experienced uh, life afterwards. And, um, and they will be present uh, and doing uh, what we call as a spine class. Um, and it's essentially, you know, it's very important for somebody who is as young, you know, and these are young females uh, who are you know, going through their growth spurt uh, primarily. Uh, it's very important for them to, to understand what they are going through because most of the, the teenagers, as well as their parents, consider success of surgery as a uh, straight looking spine on an x-ray, which essentially is not necessarily true, um, has been proven by multiple studies. And sometimes what we as a surgeon consider a success may not be noticed by, by the patients as well. So it goes both ways. 
But as far as the surgical planning itself is concerned, um, you know, bending films, if the patient has kyphosis, then I will also do a lateral over bolster film just to see how flexible they are. And then you can select the type of instrumentation, whether you will use a titanium rod versus a cobalt chrome rod. Um, and then you do consider taking into consideration their uh, rib prominences as well. Um, you know, here we have, uh, you know, abundance of bone banks and we can use the yellow graft. So we don't, I yeah, have not done uh, rib resections for a long time, but whenever we do uh, some surgeries, uh, uh, surgical camps back in India, we always struggle with that. So in those cases, we have done uh, uh, what we call as costoplasty with an added advantage of a uh, rib prominence correction. Um, and then, um, Obviously, neurological examination is very important. Any, any abnormal examination, especially the abdominal reflexes, um, we do MRI. I do not routinely do MRI in all the patients unless the patients are less than 10 years of age uh, or they have um, other symptoms like kyphosis with scoliosis, um, abnormal neurological exam, as I, as I mentioned. If they have very tight hamstrings, um, as one of the indication as well, where they can't bend, uh, bend over at all. And an extreme degree of coronal imbalance with minimal, minimal rotation on the scoliometer, which indicates that this may not be an idiopathic scoliosis. <coughs> okay. Uh, I don't have any more questions, Hitesh. Thank you, Viral. Thank you, Viral, for that fantastic presentation. And uh, we have no more questions. It was such a fantastic uh, presentation that it's going to reach a lot of people all over the world. And anyone who wants to do scoliosis surgery, I'm sure this is going to be a great presentation. Thank you so much for joining. Me. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, you know, feel free to send uh, questions. This is my email address. Um, I'll be happy to answer any queries you have.